Hello, and thanks for stopping by. Here's a question for you. What do you call this ornate tower, which looms over the northern edge of the Palace of Westminster, the seat of British government? Most people would likely respond with the phrase Big Ben, whilst others would answer St Stephen's Tower. Some might say the Elizabeth Tower, the Westminster Clock Tower, or just simply the plain old clock tower. In short, it's a surprisingly tricky question, isn't it? And one that's open to all sorts of pedantry. Although Big Ben is often the most common answer, that's a term which, as many will be at pains to point out, refers only to the huge bell housed within the clock tower. And whilst that is indeed 100% correct, I must admit that, at the risk of sounding controversial, I'm never personally bothered when the clock's referred to as Big Ben. I mean, it's obvious what people mean when they say it, isn't it? By the way, yep, that cheeky little fellow jumping up and down, that's me. As you can see, I've been a big fan of Big Ben since an early age. As for the clock's other names, well, it's never been called St Stephen's Tower, not officially anyway. St Stephen's refers to this grand entrance to Parliament, named after the old St Stephen's Chapel, which stood here until it was destroyed by fire in 1834. The official name for this landmark is in fact, the Elizabeth Tower, although it's only been called that since 2012, when it was granted the title to mark Queen Elizabeth II's Diamond Jubilee. Out of this tangle of titles though, the best known phrase is still Big Ben. But who was Ben? In what way was he big? And did you know that there have been two incarnations of the Big Ben Bell? Well, we'll get into all of that. But first, I'd like to start this story by introducing you to Big Ben's predecessor, a much older bell that went by the name of Old Tom. The Palace of Westminster, which being home to the House of Commons and the House of Lords, serves as the core of Britain's government, is a huge complex that's evolved over many centuries. It's believed the first clock to provide the time here was built towards the end of the 13th century, although sadly no surviving records of this are known to exist. The first Westminster clock that is documented was unveiled in 1367 and was located close to the present day Elizabeth Tower, in an area that, in those days, was occupied by the law courts. This 14th century clock was commissioned by King Edward III, who, it is said, obtained money for its construction by slapping a fine on the then Chief Justice Sir Ralph de Hengham, who had been caught altering court records without permission. As an apparent reminder of de Hengham's corrupt behaviour, the clock face was adorned with the Latin phrase, Deceit Justicium Moniti, pardon my pronunciation, which roughly translates as, Be warned, learn justice an inscription that was supposedly intended as a constant warning to the lawmakers working nearby. Ominous wording aside, this clock was pretty rudimentary, having just one face and one hand, which was used to mark each hour. It did however boast an impressive bell, making it the first public chiming clock in England no less, and just like Big Ben, which would follow centuries later, this old clanger had a nickname. Two nicknames in fact. At first, it was dubbed Edward of Westminster, which is most likely in honour of King Edward III who'd sanctioned it, although it could also have been a reference to Edward the Confessor, who'd founded nearby Westminster Abbey. Over time though, the clock came to be known by the more affectionate name, Old Tom of Westminster, and it remained in use for over 300 years. But by the end of the 17th century, the clock tower had sadly fallen into a dilapidated state, which eventually resulted in its demolition. The Old Tom Bell, however, was saved, and in 1698, sold to St Paul's Cathedral for the handsome sum of £385, 17 shillings and sixpence, approximately £54,000 in today's money. Once this transaction was complete, the bell was carted off to its new home at St Paul's, although on a short journey near Temple Bar, outside where the Royal Courts of Justice now stand, the bell tumbled off of the cart, causing significant damage. Not good, considering how much they'd paid for it. 
Fortunately, old Tom was recast at the White's Chapel Bell Foundry and has formed part of St Paul's Clock ever since. You can still hear the bell today. It strikes each hour and marks every 15 minute interval. After the medieval clock tower was demolished, no replacements was forthcoming, leaving folk in Westminster to rely upon two sundials for the time. You can still see a sundial on Parliament Square today. It's fixed to the tower of St Margaret's Church. Then, 135 odd years later, on the evening of the 16th of October 1834, a huge fire broke out in the Palace of Westminster, destroying almost all of the old government's complex. Only the medieval Westminster Hall survived. Given its importance, it was decided the Palace of Westminster would have to be rebuilt, and as the Inferno had provided a clean slate, it was determined, in typical 19th century fashion, that the new incarnation should be as grand and imposing as possible. Therefore, a competition to find a new design was opened up to the nation's architects. This resulted in 97 proposals being put forward, some of which are shown here. It was entry number 64, however, drawn up by Sir Charles Barry, who coincidentally had been born on Westminster's Bridge Street, right opposite where the Elizabeth Tower now stands, that won. Once awarded the prize contract, Barry employed fellow architect Augustus Pugin, who was then only in his early 20s, to assist with the project. Pugin was a specialist in Gothic design, and as such, he was responsible for designing all of the Palace of Westminster's lavish interiors and intricate exterior details, so much so that many believe he should be considered the true brains behind the building. Pugin also designed the clock tower itself, although tragically, it would prove to be his last ever piece of work. The mammoth enterprise had proved to be incredibly hard going, and the intense stress involved had severely damaged Pugin's mental health. In February 1852, at around the same time plans for the clock tower had been finalised and handed over, Augustus Pugin suffered a complete breakdown, rendering him unable to speak or even recognise his friends and family. He was transferred to Bedlam Lunatic Asylum, the building of which is now occupied by the Imperial War Museum, where he died a few months later on the 14th of September 1852, aged as 40. Next time you find yourself admiring the Elizabeth Tower, spare Augustus a thought. He was a genius, and what a legacy to leave. It took some 30 years to fully complete the new Palace of Westminster, although the clock tower managed to crank into life before that, becoming fully operational in the summer of 1859. Work on what's now known as the Elizabeth Tower had also been painfully slow going though, and it would be the Big Ben Bell itself, or bells rather, as there are in fact two, which caused the most headaches. The contract for casting the clock's first bell had been awarded to John Warner and Sons, who operated foundries in both London and northeastern England. The smaller, quarter hour bells were crafted in their London workshop, which was on 4th Street, now part of the Barbican complex, whilst Big Ben itself was cast up in Stockton on Tees, County Durham, in 1856. Weighing in at a mighty 16 tonnes, Big Ben was dubbed Big Ben from the very start, the reasons for which we'll explore soon, and once cast, it was transported to London by boat. Although whilst it was being loaded, it was accidentally dropped. It appeared undamaged, although I imagine the poor dock worker's ears must have been ringing for days afterwards. When Big Ben arrived in London, the clock tower wasn't yet complete, so the huge bell was rigged up to a scaffold beside the construction site, where it was made available for public viewing every day, and for the purposes of testing, rung on a regular basis. Things seemed fine at first, as one report put it, 
Big Ben had caused a considerable sensation, while after a few months, the powers that be decided they wanted to ramp up the volume, turn it up to 11 if you will. To achieve this, a heavier strike hammer was introduced, and not long after, on the 17th of October 1857, disaster struck, when during one of the tests, Big Ben cracked. And it was a big crack, the split being 4 feet or 1.2 meters long, which rendered the bell useless. Naturally, all manner of squabbles broke out, as those involved pointed fingers of blame at each other, and whilst they argued, the bell lay dormant in the construction yard for many months. When it came to fixing the problem, John Warner and Sons, who'd originally cast the bell, were out of the picture. Not because their reputation, like the bell had been damaged, but because the price they quoted was considered too high. George Mears, however, who at the time was in charge of the Whitechapel Bell Foundry, said he'd do the job for no more than £600, about 56000 in today's money, and so his bargain offer was snapped up. The Whitechapel Bell Foundry, which stands in the heart of the East End on the corner of Whitechapel Road and Fieldgate Street, is worthy of a video in its own right, being an historic establishment that was founded all the way back in 1750. As well as Big Ben and Old Tom, which we saw earlier, it's also cast America's Liberty Bell, which of course has ended up cracked too. Sadly, the foundry closed in 2017 after over 260 years in business, and the fate of the site currently hangs in the balance. It would take a good few months for Big Ben to be reborn. It was finally broken up with an iron wrecking ball in February 1858, shortly after which the shattered pieces were carted off to Whitechapel, where, once all of the necessary prep work had been made, it took 20 minutes to cast the metal into a new bell, which then required over a fortnight to cool. Big Ben Mark II, the Big Ben Bell as we now know it, was transported back to the clock tower on the morning of Friday the 28th of May 1858 in an elaborate procession. Placed on an iron truck, it took a team of 16 horses, all of whom had their manes decorated with flowers, three and a half hours to haul the bell, which too was festooned with flowers and flags, from Whitechapel to Westminster. To get the bell into position at the top of the clock tower, Big Ben was placed in a cradle and hoisted up on an extra strong chain, a process which took 32 hours non-stop to complete, with crews of eight men at a time working in rotating shifts to operate the winch. It would still be over a year though until the clock was fully operational. The hands, which interestingly were originally painted blue, finally began ticking on the 31st of May 1859, with the chimes kicking in on the 11th of July. Two months after which, yeah, you're going to see this one coming. The bell cracked yet again. This time though, the crack was deemed workable, although it did change the way the bell sounded, the altered clang being the one that's heard to this very day. And to prevent any further damage, it was decided to rotate the bell on a regular basis, and the crack is constantly monitored. Although fortunately, in the 160 years plus since it happened, the split doesn't appear to have spread any further. So, we now come to the burning question. Who exactly was Big Ben named after? In the 18th and 19th centuries, Big Ben appears to have been a pretty common nickname, usually employed to describe large, violent men. In Derbyshire, in August 1854 for example, a man named Benjamin Miller was tried for the murder of a local magistrate named William Bagshaw. It is reported that Milner appeared in court by the name of Big Ben and was described as being a man of Herculanean proportions. At another trial, this one held in Gateshead in April 1858, it is reported that a fellow who'd been the ringleader at a massive drunken brawl was known to friends as Big Ben, whilst at around the same time in London, there was a particularly thuggish barman, also nicknamed Big Ben, who was known for roughing up clientele at the Bermondsey Gym Palace in which he worked. 
The nickname wasn't restricted to humans. There were even prize-winning horses at the time who had dubbed Big Ben. When it comes to working out who Westminster's Big Ben Bell was named after though, there are two main contenders. The first is Sir Benjamin Hall. Born in Caerphilly, Wales in 1802, Benjamin Hall was a civil engineer who went on to forge a career in politics. By the time the clock tower was being built, he held the position first commissioner of works, meaning he was personally responsible for overseeing the manufacture and installation of the huge bell. Furthermore, Sir Benjamin happened to be tall in stature, and as such, it would appear his colleagues often referred to him as Big Ben, which in turn, and given his close connection to the project, is said to have led to the bell being blessed with the same moniker. The second theory is that the bell's name is a nod to Ben Caunt, a well-known bare-knuckle boxer and heavyweight champion who was born in Nottinghamshire in 1815. Ben was a truly formidable man. At his peak, he stood at 6 feet 2 inches tall and weighed in at 18 stone, which is impressive today, let alone by mid-19th century standards, and so it will come as no surprise to hear that he too went by the nickname Big Ben. He wasn't the first boxer to be called that though. Decades before, there had been another famed fighter known as Big Ben, that being Benjamin Brain, who was born in Bristol in 1753, and who died in London on Gray's Inn Road in 1794. It was Big Ben Cornstow though, who was well known during the era that the clock tower was being built. His most punishing match took place in 1840, when he defeated Bill Brassey after a brutal 101 rounds. This of course being in the days before the Marquess of Queensbury rules were introduced, and his last fight occurred in September 1857, just weeks before the first Big Ben Bell cracked. That match by the way, which was against Nat Langham, was declared a draw after 60 rounds. In 1845, Ben Cornt began a second career as a pub landlord, using the prize money he'd earned through boxing to purchase the coach and horses on St Martin's Lane in Covent Garden a site that's now occupied by a very fine tavern called the Salisbury, which for a time was called the Ben Corn's Head in honour of its former resident. The business was successful for a good few years, although Ben would later suffer immense tragedy in his life. A fire broke out at the pub in 1851, which resulted in the deaths of his two children, Martha and Cornelius, and in 1859, his wife, also called Martha, passed away. The former boxer continued to run the pub, but he was a shadow of his former self, and he died on St Martin's Lane in 1861, aged just 46. So, out of Sir Benjamin Hall and Ben Court, who holds the best claim to the Big Ben Bell? Well, going by contemporary accounts, it would appear the evidence is stacked in favour of Benjamin Hall, his name is engraved upon the bell itself, and in an article from the South London Journal dated the 4th of November 1856, it explicitly states that, quote, It is proposed to call our King of Bells Big Ben, in honour of Sir Benjamin Hall, the President of the Board of Works. Having said that, I have a feeling that the bell's nickname still owes much to Ben Court. You see, Ben had been boxing since the 1830s, meaning he helped popularise the phrase Big Ben long before the clock tower had even been envisioned. It's not too much of a stretch, therefore, to assume that a fair few politicians, many of whom no doubt followed sports and liked to flutter, were familiar with Big Ben Corns the boxer, which in turn inspired them to start jokingly referring to their colleague, Sir Benjamin Hall, as Big Ben. I also like to think that Ben Cornt was the people's choice. Being a respected fellow from a humble background, who ran a popular pub just over a mile from the famous clock tower, it's likely it was Big Ben the boxer rather than the first commissioner of works, who most everyday folk were reminded of when hearing those famous Westminster chimes. What do you think?
Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this look at the story of Westminster's Big Ben Bell. And as always, I would love to hear your own thoughts on its history. Who do you think was responsible for damaging the original? What personal memories do you have in connection with the famous clock tower? And who do you think the bell was truly named after? Please do be sure to share your thoughts in the comments. Thank you so much to all of you who support my channel with your kind words, likes and shares. I couldn't do this without you. If you haven't yet subscribed to Rob's London, then I'd appreciate it very much if you could please consider doing so, as this, along with clicking the bell icon to receive notifications, will ensure that you don't miss out whenever I publish a new video. Plus, of course, it'd be wonderful to have you along. If you're feeling extra generous, you can also support my work with a tip via either my Ko-fi account, which I'll link below, or the YouTube thanks button, which appears as a heart icon beneath the video. Any such financial donations are of course greatly appreciated and they really do help go towards creating content. Anyway, on that note, thanks again for watching friends. Stay well and please be sure to stay tuned.